All right. Well, look, I'm excited about tonight. I've just been thinking about the power of conversation. Because with a good conversation, you can walk away with exactly what you needed. And I've found that life is pretty much just a series of decisions. It's pretty much all you do. You just make decision after decision. And life is a journey of not knowing what to do until you figure out what to do. And then you encounter the next thing that you don't know what to do with. And that's why conversation is helpful. And this is why the gift of the Bible is really helpful, because we are finite beings and we are limited in our understanding, but we also have what could be described as limitless possibilities in front of us. So we're trying to navigate lim limitless possibilities with limited understanding. And this is why we need a limitless God who is all-knowing to help guide us. And I'm saying this because I've been trying to figure out a lot of things. And I've just realized that life is not getting easier. So if, in case you're wondering, as life goes on, it's not going to slow down. And it's not really going to get simpler. And it's not really going to get easier. That's all I got. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But life is not going to get simpler and it's not going to get easier. In fact, it's going to continue to be challenging. And when you hear that, it can do a series of things for you. Uh, for some of you guys, that may hit you and that may feel super discouraging. I know when I was first thinking about it, just earlier this week, that thought was kind of discouraging for me. I was having a conversation with a friend and he was talking about some things that, that he's learning. God's kind of taken him on a journey with some uh, of the ministry that he's called him to and he's helping a lot of people walk through different challenges that they're having in their lives. And he's telling me about where deep-seated issues come from and all these things that people are having to navigate. And I'm just like, this is a lot. And why is life this way? Why is life like this series of difficult things? And once you get through one difficult thing, you go to another difficult thing. Has anybody ever felt that way? Has anybody ever wondered that? Like, why is life this way? <laughs> well, the question came to mind in the midst of that. How many of you guys know that God is very present with us? And God is, here's what I'm starting to be more aware of and perceive more and more, that um, a lot of stuff that is normal to us, like thinking, is actually like a really powerful thing. Like, what is that? Just us being conscious, right? Our, our, our conscious awareness, just being. And then having the ability to think, the ability to evaluate things, the ability to imagine things. All of this is not just something to be glanced over. And so... When God says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and that's really how we become more and more like him who's limitless in his understanding, and we run into problems all the time, perhaps God intended it to be this way, that every situation we run into that we're trying to figure out is an opportunity for him to start speaking his wisdom and his truth into. And so that's exactly what was happening in this moment, that as I'm asking this question, another question comes to my mind. And the other question that comes to my mind 
Now, some of you may think, well, you know, your brain just does stuff. And that's one way to look at it. But when a question, especially about the Bible, comes to your mind in the midst of trying to navigate a situation, that sounds very consistent to what the, the function of the Holy Spirit is that Jesus described. And he told his disciples, he said, when I leave, the counselor will come to you. And he will guide you into all truth. And he will remind you of the things that I've taught you. Do you know that's a huge function of the Holy Spirit? Literally just helping you figure stuff out. And figure stuff out half the time by reminding you of things that God said. Reminding you of the Bible verses that you do know. That's why the more you know, the more he can feed you. The more that you've taken in, the more he can bring up to the surface. And so the question came to my mind, is the promised land a place of peace or a place of war? Is the promised land a place of peace or is it a place of war? That's what I want to talk about tonight. Is it peace? Is it war? If you don't know what I'm talking about, first I would encourage you to go back and listen to this kind of series of messages that we've been in, talking about this picture that God has given us of how we have relationship with him through the journey that he's taken the, the, the Israelites on in the Old Testament. He delivers them from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. And he has a plan for what he wants to do after delivering them. And we talked about how salvation the concept of being saved is very similar to what he did with the Israelites when he delivered them out of Egypt. But it wasn't the end of the story. And the promised land was a land that God promised to a man named Abraham. He said, I am going to bring your descendants into this land. And Abraham never got to see the fulfillment of that because it happened way later, generations and generations later. But God came through on his promise. But I want us to, to examine what kind of land God was bringing them to. And that's what I want us to look at tonight. And so I want us to look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. God first promises the land to Abraham, and then that, that promise is inherited by Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons, and then uh, 400 years of slavery go by, and they become this huge, big nation. And then God shows up to a man named Moses, who is of the same lineage of Abraham, one of the descendants that God promised Abraham. And, and he appears to Moses and says this, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. And I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, if that was the end of it, that would be pretty much how most of us would want it to be, that God is gonna bring us from a difficult situation and everything that we're challenged by and oppressed by, and he's gonna bring us into a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, whether you like milk or like honey, you know that that's a good description. You know that that means it's a good place, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But then he adds this onto it. He says, the territory of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, doesn't stop there, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so the answer to that question, is the promised land a place of peace or a place of war, is kind of a complicated question. And the simple answer is it's both. And that's pretty much how life operates. You know that we cannot fully understand God but we can pick up on his ways 
and we could get to know his characteristics and we could come to know ways that he operates, even if we don't understand the totality of who he is and the totality of how he operates, he gives us glimpses into his character because he wants us to understand him. And this is something that I think is so important to put in front of us to wrestle with tonight. And maybe for a couple days, maybe for a couple weeks, maybe for a couple months. I don't know how this is going to land with you, but I do know that it's true. That God is not just a one-track God. He is, he is indescribable, but he has some characteristics like this. He's a God of peace. He calls himself the Prince of Peace. Paul describes him as the God of peace. Also says that we can receive the peace of God. There's no other supernatural being described that gives peace. This is a unique characteristic of God. And yet, he is also called the Lord of hosts. And some translations translate that as the Lord of heaven's armies. And we get glimpses into there's more going on than what we think is going on half the time. There's this interesting occasion that happens in the book of Daniel, where Daniel, uh, he, he goes into a time of fasting and prayer, and he's praying for something for 21 days. And in the midst of that, he doesn't really know what's happening. He just knows he's fasting, and he knows he's praying. And at the end of 21 days, he gets visited by an angel. And the angel tells him, didn't have to tell him, but told him, hey, as soon as you started praying, God heard you and answered your prayers. And he sent me. I mean, as soon as you started praying, as soon as you, you humbled yourself and you fasted and you opened your mouth to pray, the God of all of creation heard you and immediately went into action because he listens to his people and he cares about his people and he sees his people and he knows what's going on and he knows the unique details of your situation and he's not too busy to attend to your situation. However, the angel says, he sent me and then I got in a fight. This is what he says. I, I started scrapping squabbling in the heavens. This is what's happening. He doesn't use that terminology. That's a more recent translation. But he says that I was resisted. I was fought against by, he, and he names a, a, a deity, the prince of Persia. Not deity, but a spiritual entity. The prince of Persia, which was a principality over a particular region where Daniel was and tried to stop the angel that God was sending. And you know, it wasn't actually an easy fight. He's fighting so much that God had to send another angel to help him. Do you know that God is also a God of war? Not because I want him to be, just because he is. I mean, think about this. Most of us, we would think that humans created war. But as far as I can see, humans did not create war if war is happening even in the heavens. And, and we're told about this ancient serpent who rebelled against God in heaven. Conflict in heaven. Rebellion in heaven. A third of the angels cast down from heaven. Now at war against the angels who are still there. War. Is he a God of peace or is he a God of war? Is it possible that he's both? And so is the place that he's taking you and I to a place of peace or a place of war? As best as I can understand, it's both. And that's why life feels that way. You know, like, it's like stuff never stops. It's like, it never stops. There's always something going on. Some of you guys were facing challenges today. 
And it could be in any area of your life. There is no area of your life that is exempt from challenges. There's no area of your life. Even the one that you're imagining in front of you, the place that you're trying to get to, is not just a place of peace. You know, the destination that God has given you a vision for, that you know you're moving towards, that you're working towards, that you are feeling drawn and called towards in the same way that he called Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and all of them towards this place. He didn't call them necessarily to paradise. He calls them to a place that he has set apart for them, that he has made good for them, but that is not free from challenges. And it's the same thing for you and for me. And here's what I found, that you and I, we will really, 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 really struggle in our relationship with God if every time we run into challenges and as challenges increase, we get discouraged because we didn't think it was supposed to be this way. And I felt like that's what was happening for me in the midst of the conversation. Like, why is life so hard? Like, why? It's just every new thing. It's just difficult. And I find myself in having conversations with people. If you want to talk about the next thing, praise God, it's going to be difficult. Are you prepared for that? Are you ready for that? Do you know that it's going to be challenging? And sometimes I have to chill on that. But if there is anything that I have found... It's that whatever is in front of you, as amazing as it is, it's also going to be probably just as challenging. And that's what we're seeing. It's it's not even just like an isolated incident in the scriptures. It's constant. Pick a life of anyone in the scriptures and show me a life without consistent challenges. Show me a life with situations that wouldn't be confusing and difficult to figure out. That's why the scriptures are a gift. Because you get to see what life is actually like. Not just come up with it for yourself. But hear from God and see from God. Oh, this is actually how things are supposed to be. But that's not the end of it. I would say that we engage in war to establish and maintain peace. This is what I found, that peace doesn't just show up because problems arise and problems don't just disappear. Problems show up and they they often don't disappear until something shifts, something changes, and a decision is made. And oftentimes, your problems get solved when you figure out the decision to make. And it's war often just to get to that place. But it does not have to be a place of defeat. It's a wrestle, but it doesn't have to be a place of defeat. David said this in, in Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for warfare. Blessed be the Lord, not just my encourager, Not just my comforter, not just my healer, but my rock who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for warfare. God is not just a God of peace, though he is a God of peace and is the prince of peace. He is also a God of war. And here's what I found. What we see the picture taking place well, the picture that we see taking place with the uh, Israelites being rescued from Egypt and then brought into a place of, of promise, but that would also have battles is this, that God rescues you from the battle you could not win, then walks you into the battles you can win. So he rescued them from Egypt because they could not escape Egypt on their own. 
God rescues you from sin because you could not get free from sin on your own. God rescues you from death and depravity and darkness because without the power of God and the Holy Spirit, you cannot get free. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. That means the slave has no power over the master. The slave does not get to make the rules, does not get to say, hey, I want a break, does not get to say, hey, I want off today, hey, I want to go on vacation, hey, I quit. There is none of that. The slave is only told what to do, and that's what sin does to you outside of Jesus. And so Jesus miraculously, dramatically, and powerfully saves us from sin by his blood. This is the work that's done on the cross. So if you ever hear somebody describe the work of Jesus on the cross, that's why it's described that way, because it wasn't just a random event that happened, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a place where he was a victim. He was actually working on your behalf by offering himself after living a sinless life, after facing every temptation that you face and making the right decision. When he wrestled with it, when he didn't know what to do, he still did the right thing. He wrestled with all the stuff you wrestle with. His eyes, his heart, his mind, his thoughts, the temptations of the enemy, demonic and spiritual warfare. He wrestled with it all, but he did it right. And then he said, okay, now that I have accomplished living a sinless life, even into adulthood and even into my 30s, now I'm going to offer myself as a sacrifice, because the wages of sin is death, I'm offering myself as a sacrifice on behalf of everyone who would never be able to live the life I just lived. And the perfect life is exchanged for the imperfect life and is accepted by God, is accepted by the Father. That is a worthy sacrifice. That is a worthy payment. Now they can be forgiven because of what you've done, the work that you've accomplished. He saves us from sin through that one act, in the same way that God walks the Israelites out of Egypt in one night, and they never go back. But the place they're going to is not a place where there will be no fight. It's the fact that he did all the fighting on their behalf to get them out of Egypt. Jesus did all the work to get you out of sin. He lived the sinless life, he went through the crucifixion. He resurrected from the dead. He's the one who put the whole strategy in place, taught his disciples for years, called them apostles, gave them a plan, sent the Holy Spirit, empowered them to spread the message throughout the whole earth. He formulated all of that, did it. Now you get to walk out of everything that had you in bondage. So every sin that you have ever committed can be forgiven. You can walk out of it freely by receiving what Jesus has done. And then what, what you're walking towards is not always what you think it's going to be. Because it is a good place. It is a great place. It is a beautiful place. It is a place where God is, but it is also a place where enemies reside. And that's the reality of life. And so you get saved, but then there's still more stuff. And that's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing that I want us to talk about is conflict. And this, that the peace of God is not the absence of conflict. The peace of God is not the absence of conflict. Many of you guys may have heard Martin Luther King Jr. said that, that true peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. And that is a great quote. But a greater quote is this, because this is not about just civil matters and personal and natural matters, but supernatural matters. The peace of God is not an absence of conflict. And many of us, that's what, it's like that's what we're searching for. And even if we don't say it out loud, if we don't verbalize it, that's what we're asking for. God, I don't want this battle. Why is this so difficult? Why is there resistance? Why is there opposition? Why do you allow so much to come against me? Remove the conflict from my life. I thought that my, the, the blessed life would be a life where I'm not getting fought against. 
I thought that if you promised me a land, it would just flow with milk and honey. And God says, yes, I understand you thought that. And I love you enough to help you understand that you're not God. And that I understand what perfect is even when you don't. And for some reason, uh, in a way that you cannot understand, the presence of conflict is better for you right now than the absence of it. The presence of conflict right now in this very moment is better for you than the absence of conflict if you can receive that. That's the only reason God would do it is if it's better. This is why the second verse in Psalm 144, David says, he is my faithful love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. He is my shield and I take refuge in him. He subdues my people under me. You don't need a fortress or a stronghold or a deliverer or a shield or a refuge if there is no conflict. And you never get to learn that God is any of those things without conflict. You would never know the power of prayer if there were not conflict. You would never know the power of prayer to change a situation, to change your own heart, to change your own perspective, to bring supernatural protection around you, to change stuff. You would never know it if there were not conflict. David would never know this aspect of God if God did not reveal this aspect to him. We would not know that God were a God of war if he did not reveal it to us. But I'm glad that God is not afraid of a fight. I appreciate that. I appreciate that God is willing to fight on my behalf, especially. I don't want to fight against him. But think about that. I have the weight of the God of the universe on my side. This is who we are as a church that we have the weight of the God who controls everything and is not afraid of a fight and is saying, if you need me, I got you. And I'm going to show you that by allowing things to come against you. And no, I'm not just going to swoop in like I did in Egypt. I'm going to give you space to figure it out and learn and wrestle and struggle and cry and weep and grieve and figure it out, just like he allowed Jesus to. Sweat drops of blood. Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Silence. Silence. Well, I guess there's no other way. So not my will, but your will be done. And he's arrested. He's betrayed by one of his closest followers. Conflict. Betrayal. I mean, somebody who he has invested in, loved, cared for. Goes and because they don't. You guys know why he had to get betrayed? Because the people coming and looking for him didn't know what he looked like. This is why Judas says to them, the one that I go up and give a kiss to, that's him. The only reason he would say that is if they don't know what he looks like. And so Judas is saying, I'll lead you to where he is. I know that he's going to be in this garden praying. And if you guys want to arrest him, you guys are going to have to do it at night because if you try to do it during the day, his crowd of supporters is too strong. You're never going to be able to do that. So you're going to have to catch him in a place where he's vulnerable and only somebody close to him would know that. This is why the betrayal was so deep. And so Judas leads the Roman officials to him and they arrest him. Conflict. His disciples flee. They run. They're scared. Conflict. Peter follows behind them. 
Peter ends up at the same place where Jesus is under, undergoing the first trial and, and people recognize Peter and they're like, you're one of his guys. Aren't you normally with him? And Peter is like, no, I'm not. I don't know that man. I promise you I don't know that man. And Peter starts cursing just to prove that he doesn't know Jesus. And yet you and I, we ask if it's okay to curse even though we love Jesus. But Peter, Peter curses to prove he doesn't. That's another message. So... So, <laughs> so, Peter is doing all this, and Jesus is right there. And Jesus looks at him, makes eye contact. Conflict. What do I do when I'm under trial for something I did not do, but God, I know it's your will, but even my best friends are betraying me at the very same time. The people who said they would never leave my side are denying that they even know me. And then these people in front of me who I could literally strike down with a word from my mouth are disrespecting me, slapping me, pulling my beard out, beating me. And at any moment, if I wanted, I could call the armies, heaven's armies that I'm Lord of, to do whatever I wanted in this moment. Conflict. The Father is silent. I'm allowing you to figure this out. It's a war, a war in the mind wrestling with every fiber of his being to continue with the process. It's conflict. And this is why David would say that he trains my hands for battle. I found that life is full of battles. Life is full of challenges. And God will train me for every single one of them. Every decision that I have to make, God will train me to do it. Every difficult decision that I have to make in a short amount of time, with the limited information and knowledge, God will train me and develop me and I will continue to learn until there's something new to learn. Conflict will develop us, ultimately. So this is why if we fast forward to the New Testament, Paul says this in Ephesians 6, put on the full war language armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, war language, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. We are at war. Whether we like it or not, there's a war in front of us. Whether we like it or not, life is full of conflict while we are here on this earth. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Just like Jesus had trouble. Life is full of conflict. Life tends to be difficult. Life tends to be challenging. So I want you to think about this. Where in your life are you experiencing intense conflict? Probably somewhere. Where is it? Think about it. Write it down. Where are you experiencing an intense conflict? Where? Sometimes it's not always the most like prevalent wrestle. We may have had a phenomenal day. I'm not saying that you have a bad day happening. What I am saying is that where are you having to make decisions where you don't have all the answers? It may be in your relationship life, conflict, figuring out, I mean, especially marriage, two people coming together as one, trying to figure out everything together with different personalities, upbringings, wirings. It is a breeding ground for conflict. This is why so many people get divorced. This is why the understanding of marriage is decreasing so much in our culture. Because as God is removed from the culture, then of course what he has instituted that breeds conflict 
is being avoided. People are looking and saying, why would I get married? It's conflict waiting to happen. Yes, it is. Just like the promised land is conflict waiting to happen. And if you want to go there and you want the milk and the honey, <laughs> then you got a deal. <laughs> If you <laughs> that was not planned. There's also the conflicts that you have to navigate one at a time. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites. It's one at a time. It's not even just one thing. Because that's the interesting thing about the promised land. You know, Egypt was ruled by uh, an empire. It had one superpower ruling over it. But the land that God was calling them to didn't even have one superpower. It was like split up into all these different tribes with all these different kings. That's why they had all these unique and different battles. And life for you is the same way. There is not one superpower that you take out and then you have no conflict. But you deal with the Canaanites and they got one situation going on. So even like when they go to Jericho, you know, they, they, God tells them to march around these walls and then the walls are going to fall down. And then that never happens again. You would think, oh, God just taught us how to beat all of our enemies. No, he taught you how to beat that one. So praise God, you got free from this one habit. And you learned and you grew because you wrestled with it and God walked you through it. And now there's another one. You had one relationship that you had to wrestle your way through and navigate, and now there's another one that's confusing in a different way. Because I thought that I, thought that I knew what I was looking for, and now when I got in the situation, I realized it's not as easy to navigate as I thought, and so... Is this the person that I should marry? Is it not? How do you know when somebody's the one? And here's, here's what everyone, here's what everyone who has found the one will tell you. Well, you know. Yeah, like when you find the one, you just know. And the reality is, <laughs> it's true. But, but, but listen, 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 listen. You know, you know, listen, 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 I'm not done. You know that you know because you know what it feels like to not know. Well, Dr. Seuss for you. <laughs> but it's true. You have enough encounters. You have enough encounters with not knowing that knowing becomes clearer. I had enough dates and conversations and confusing situations to know what clarity looked like. So sometimes we're, we're mad that it's confusing. And the truth is, it's confusing because you don't know yet. And the only way to know is to learn. But it's a different perspective to say, I'm going through this situation and I'm learning. And I'm not trying to rush the process. Conflict, when dealt with in the right way, will be beneficial for you because this is actually God's way of going about things. Is actually challenge to challenge, depending on him in this situation to teach me and grow me and grow my decision-making abilities. Now into the next one to teach me and grow me and grow my decision-making abilities. Anybody who you see doing anything really significant at a high level will tell you this. That, that, that the difference between somebody operating at a high level and a low level is their decision making. That's it. 
That's it. You're not going to find somebody operating at a very high level of success on a consistent basis that does not have good decision making in the areas that are necessary for that success. That doesn't mean that person always has great integrity because there are a lot of successful people with poor integrity, but I can tell you that certain principles they will abide by because it just does not work if they don't. It's like all kinds of farmers can have different personalities and, and integrity and character, but sowing and reaping does not change. And the ones who do it well, do it well, regardless of their integrity. And the ones who don't, don't. The ones who can make the right decisions in the field. are going to reap the benefits of that. And the ones who don't, don't. This is why God grows us through growing our decision-making, and our decision-making only grows through conflict. This is why the battles were necessary, because the battles were not necessarily about hand-to-hand combat. It was about decision-making. And warfare is about decision-making. Leading a military is not as much about hand-to-hand combat as it is decision-making. This is why I think about David being a shepherd and then being uh, um, in the military. And why do you think God brought him this way? He knows how to function with sheep. Then God graduates him from that level of decision-making to then being in the military and being a part of combat. Then he's leading combat. Then he's leading at a higher level, and it's all growing his decision-making. Why? Because, yes, he got oil poured over him and anointed to be king, but kings have to make big decisions. It's like we, we want to be king, Because we want to sit on the throne and we want a crown, but it's not about that. The king is the one who's making the final say, the final call, the final decisions. And your decision making has to match your position. And this is why conflict is necessary, because the conflicts only get bigger and the conflicts only get more costly. So now you go from fighting one-on-one battles to now making calls for thousands of people fighting one-on-one battles and they have to do what you say. So good thing you've actually experienced fighting. That'll help. Conflict to conflict improves our decision-making. And... um, Here's where I want us to land. We first talked about conflict. Now I want us to understand the real purpose of it is conquest. Conquest. Conquest is this, the act or process of conquering. God was leading them into conflict to learn, yes, but also to conquer. God is not just a God of war who likes fighting. He's a God of victory and has the final say in what he says will be accomplished and what he attempts will be accomplished. There's no like trying and failing with God. He's going to win. And so it's the same thing for you. The the end result of your conflict, contrary to what the enemy is telling you, contrary to what your brain is telling you sometimes, the end result of your conflict is not your defeat. That was never the goal. He says, I'm taking you into the land that I've promised to you that currently belongs to these people that you're going to have to fight. What does that imply? That you're going to lose? Why would he take you there to lose? But that's often what we feel when we step into that kind of situation, that, God, you have brought me here to lose. And it's not true. God has not brought you into the situation you're in right now to lose. He brought you into the situation to win. It's clear as day. In order to obey the command, winning kind of is required. To go into all the world and make disciples... If he wants you to do that and you're, in it, and you're running into conflict, what's the end goal? The goal is still what he told you to do. But you have to navigate through the conflict in order to accomplish it. In the same way that they had to navigate each and every battle in order to actually rest in the land. And so it took them seven years to actually conquest 
the land that God had called them to. Think about that. They're in the land, but it took them seven years to actually defeat all of the enemies who were occupying the land. And we can see that in Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9. It says this, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. I've given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you. That means people are going to try. As long as you live, I will be with you. That means there are going to be times that you think I'm not. Just as I was with Moses, I will not leave you or abandon you. That means there are going to be times where you feel like I'm going to leave you or abandon you. Be strong. There's going to be times that you feel like you're weak and courageous because you're going to be tempted to be afraid. For you will distribute the land I swore to their ancestors to give them as an inheritance. The fight is fixed. The victory is, is won. It's guaranteed, but you're going to have to walk through every step of conquering it. And so here's what I'd say. How do you conquer your conflict? Number one is you don't stop moving forward. He said, every place the sole of your foot treads, I've given you just as I've given Moses. Don't stop moving forward. Keep your feet moving. Don't stop. Don't stop. That's where so many people end up losing because they just don't keep moving forward. God cannot give you victory If you don't go, you cannot win the battle if you stop fighting. You will never conquer that thing if you stop fighting. You will never see the victory if you stop fighting. You will never see God come through for you if you just stop. Because this is not Egypt anymore. God sent the plagues and he brought them out of Egypt. But he sent them into the promised land and said, now it's time for you guys to fight and I'm with you. But you're going to have to take every step with the sole of your feet and understand that everywhere your foot goes, I've given to you, even if it doesn't look like it because of all these enemies around you. And so, yes, you may be coming from a rough background. You may have been addicted to that thing for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You may be coming from that. And yet where your sole of your foot treads, I've given you. Even though it looks like you're still going to be addicted, I need you to understand that where you are walking now is not Egypt. Where you are walking now is not where you're a slave. Where you're walking now, you are free. Where you're walking now, I've given you, I am with you, but yes, you are going to have to conquer it. So yes, that may mean that you're going to have to take some steps to figure it out. You may have to wrestle with it, pray through it, ask for help, ask for advice, cut some people off. I have to learn. But God, help me get through it because I believe I can conquer it. And I've seen this in my own life. Sin after sin. God will teach me how to get free from it. And that is the most important peace. So often we're looking for God to just remove things from our lives that he wants us to learn how to be free from. You know, you're free in the sense that you are no longer a slave. This thing no longer has power over you. This thing will no longer guarantee you're going to hell. And yet now you have to exercise the fact that you have a choice whether you're going to do it or not. Because you still have the choice to do it. You can leave Egypt and still do the same stuff you were doing in Egypt, but now you don't have to. And so you have to figure out, how do I get a different appetite? Because I'm used to eating the stuff that was there, and now we're in a different land. How do I get an appetite for this? So for me, getting an appetite for the word of God, I realized happened the more I consumed it. The more time I would spend with God, I realized that was really my only weapon against sin. It's not just trying to stop sinning. That's bad. I want to stop doing that. Yeah, you probably want to, but are you going to? 
No, not if you're not moving towards something, not if you're not learning how to make a different decision, not if your perspective isn't changing. And so the the only thing that really took me to a new place was a new vision that God, I believe you actually have a different life for me. Like you have a different life for me. Not just that I gotta stop doing this and keep doing, no, I'm trying to get somewhere. I see the person you're calling me to be and I wanna be that person, so I need to learn how to be that person. God, would you help me? And the only way that's gonna happen is spending time with him, asking him those questions. God, I feel stuck with this. I still want this, I still have this appetite. Lord, what do I do about this? Because I still have the appetite, but I know you're calling me to operate this way. And I cannot operate this way if everything in me only wants to do this all the time. That's the wrestle. That's the wrestle that God is not going to take from you. He's going to walk you through. Do you realize that part of your appetite is because you're seeing it a way that you're not supposed to see it? That's part of it. It's just, it, and if you just stop the act, then, then your perspective on it would never change. If, if, you just, if you just said, all right, I'm not smoking anymore, even though nothing about why I felt like it was good has changed. And so I still like it just as much technically, I just don't do it anymore. I have not become more like God because God does not like that. God does not want me to alter my state of consciousness. God wants me to be in a sober place so I can continually make good decisions. And he doesn't want something infringing on my ability to make decisions because life is just decisions. And he doesn't want something infringing on my ability to pray because life requires prayer in any given moment. So, If it was just about I'm going to stop the act and I didn't learn anything about it. You see how when you see it differently, it'll actually help you stay away from it more. You know, like I had to I had to realize at a certain point, alcohol, like the effects that it has is because it's poisoning your body. It's you reacting to poison. That's why you're like, oh, because you're getting poisoned. That's why you're throwing up because your body is trying to get the poison out of you. That's why you're sweating, and we just make whole events out of it. Hey, guys, come out, consume poison, and let's all enjoy the effects of the poison while music blasts. (laughs) I had to see it differently because I loved partying, and now I see it like that. It's easier to not go do it. You see how that wrestling and the wondering and the questioning helps me to make different decisions. That's what I realized. If you go person to person, it's because you're not seeing people as people. Because if I believe this is a person that God loves, that God has a purpose for, that God has a destiny over, and I'm not really a part of that purpose or destiny, then why am I here? That's ultimately what I had to realize. That was not my perspective in the past, so it was difficult. So God walked me through. Amen? Amen. All right. And so you don't stop moving forward, and you just learn the lesson that you're being taught. And that's really what I just explained. Learn the lesson that you're being taught. Every enemy was unique. Every battle was fought differently for a reason. They all revealed a lesson to be learned. And every conflict can teach us about God, about ourselves, and or about others. So you can find value in your conflicts by learning and growing. Amen. This is why this is why James said this, and I'm going to close right here. James one verses two through four. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith, the conflict that you go through produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect. Let the result of you going through conflict after conflict without giving up have its full effect. Here's what it is. You become mature and complete, lacking nothing. How is that possible? It's because each conflict added something different to you that you lacked. 
So now, if you go through conflict after conflict after conflict, if you go through disappointment after discouragement, after I hoped this wouldn't happen, after I hoped that this would work out differently, and yet I had to wrestle through it and pray through it and make new decisions, now my decision-making has changed drastically, and I am more mature in how I approach life, and now I'm not lacking the things that I lacked. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, we're going to close right here. Woo! I've been talking a lot. And so I, I want to close a little bit differently today. Um, I want to give us an opportunity, if you guys will stand to your feet. I want to give us an opportunity uh, to do two things. The first thing that I want us to do, uh, well, I'll tell you the second thing that I want us to do first. The second thing that I want us to do is have a quick discussion about this. So we're going to put up some discussion questions, and I'm going to ask you guys to just have a brief discussion with people around you. And here's why. I want to break down, break down our consumer tendencies when God has called us to be connected. No matter how much we may not want to in any given moment, God has called us to be one. He has called us to be connected. He's called us to be a community. And we're going to do that through engaging with each other for all night. No, just for a short period of time, for a few minutes. But here's what I want to do. First, you cannot answer the questions that we're about to discuss if you are not saved. And so I talked earlier about God delivering out of Egypt and in the same way that those of us who are in sin outside of Christ, we, we need to be saved from that. And that happens through the work that he did on the cross and us saying yes to it. And so if, if you are in this place, I want to invite you, if you're watching online and, and this is you, then I invite you in, in your own way to participate in this. But if that's you, before we move any further, I want to give you an opportunity if you know that's you tonight, that you've been running into conflict after conflict and situation after situation, and you're realizing that you do need God with you, but you have not had him with you because you have not been with him. And you're saying, I want to step into relationship with Jesus. I want to be a part of the bigger story that he has for me. I want to be a part of what he's actually doing. Then I want to invite you to make a decision right now in this moment. And if you know that is you, before we move forward and before we have discussions, I just want you to lift your hand and say, it's me. I know. I know that I need to be saved by the Lord Jesus. I want to place my faith in him. I see you guys. I know that this is me. I see you guys' hands. I want to ask you guys to make one more step. If you guys would just come down here so I can pray for you, because I'd like to have the discussion with you. I know that it's a step of courage. Praise God. So glad that you came down. I know that it takes some bravery. Amen. Yeah. Is there anybody else? I feel like I saw some hands back there that didn't walk down. I just want to give you an opportunity. It's not to embarrass you at all. We actually want an opportunity to celebrate you. Praise God. And just solidify what God's doing. You guys can come down closer. Come down closer. Man, this is amazing. So glad that you guys are here tonight. God had something special for you. Come on. Man. Bro. Wow. This is special. This is special. So glad that you guys came down here. So glad that you guys are here tonight. I'm proud of y'all. You guys can come down this way. I'm proud of you guys, man. I saw you guys' hands in the back. I didn't want to call y'all out. I'm so glad, man, that you guys made the decision. And it's a wrestle. 
It's like what I'm talking about tonight. It's a wrestle, man. Do I, am I really making this decision? Am I going to do something costly? Am I going to do something uncomfortable? I could tell you that you guys made the right decision tonight. God, God set you up tonight to have a moment with him and encounter with him because he's alive, he's real, and he loves you. Like he knows you and he loves you. This is why he's called you out here and he's moved on your heart. You know, people don't just make this decision randomly. Like what you guys just did, y'all came to church tonight. Y'all listened to me talk about all kind of stuff. We laughed, we joked, we thought. But at the end of the day, God spoke very clearly to you about your life and that he's inviting you into relationship with him. And that was his goal. And so I want to walk you guys through a prayer. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an exchange that needs to take place. It's a moment that you guys are about to have. It, it, it is that deliverance moment, that out of Egypt moment, that walking through the Red Sea moment where God does something miraculous in your life and takes you from where you were and who you were and the decisions you were making and the way that you saw life into a new way of making decisions, into a new way of seeing life, into actually experiencing him and his presence and closeness with him. He's gonna fill you with his spirit, which is a huge deal. And so what we're gonna do is we're just going to confess him. Jesus, I believe in who you are. I'm turning away from my old life. I'm receiving the new life you have for me. And we're going to, to express that belief to him. So I want you guys to close your eyes. Just have a personal moment with Jesus. Understand that this is the moment your life changes. The first of many life-changing moments with Jesus. And I want you guys to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I hear you. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe you lived a sinless life and died on a cross so that I could be forgiven for every sin, everything that I would have been ashamed of, you've paid the price for, and so I give it to you. I give you my old life. I repent for my sins, all of my wicked ways, everything that I've done in rebellion against you, I completely turn from and I turn to you. I receive your forgiveness and your righteousness. I confess that you are Lord of my life. I will follow you. I will submit to you. I will say yes to you all the days of my life. Have your way with my life. I want to know you. I pray that you teach me, that you speak to me. I pray that you fill me with your spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So happy for you guys. This was huge. Uh, what we're about to do, you guys are going to go into a, a time of discussion uh, where you're, you're just for 10 minutes, you're going to turn to three people around you answer these questions and pray with each other. And you guys, I would love the opportunity to connect with you guys. You guys are gonna go right through these doors right here uh, once I pray, and if you guys want to. But I would invite you. I would love for you guys to, uh, to connect with you guys right through those doors. And so I wanna pray, and then we're gonna go into a time. Father, I thank you for what you did tonight. Lord, I thank you for every way that you've spoken to our hearts. Lord, for everything that you've done in our lives, for every life that you've transformed, for every heart that you've encouraged, Lord, for every spirit that you've lifted. And God, I pray that you would have your way even in these discussions, Lord, that we would, that we would live out the truth of the gospel, Lord, that we would experience the life that comes with community, the life that comes with following you. In Jesus' name, amen.